Now, we all come from very differing backgrounds on this panel this evening. I'm a mobile journalist and I train journalists in how to tell stories online using their smartphone. And Mike, so tell me about The Hook. It's a very big company. You've got millions and of views and you're working with different companies all over the world. It's a very big scale. We are a social publisher and we're also a marketing agency. Um, our kind of mantra is create, laugh and inspire. So everything we do is either there to make you laugh or inspire you. And if we've not, please don't check now, but if we've not, then we've not done our job basically. So we're kind of Instagram, Facebook and TikTok are our main platforms. Now, I know that The Hook is one of those channels that you watch and you think, oh, why didn't I think of that? That's such a funny way to do it. You, like, you fried eggs on social media. <laughs> You've done stuff with The Rock. It's very celebrity focused and that kind of engaging Gen Z and millennials. Yeah, so we do a lot of celebrity interviews. So we have like The Rock, Kevin Hart, that all the time. The fried egg was when Facebook Live first came out. It was like the hottest day of the year. So we just got our phones out and tried to fry an egg on the street. And it got like a million views just through people watching. It was like an algorithm hack, but people were like obsessed with Facebook Live at the time. Uh, we do a lot of kind of, we call mashups, so taking existing footage, and you can do it under fair use, it's not breaking the law technically. And um, we'll put heads on to change narratives of videos, and that's like rotoscoping and stuff. Um, yeah, we just try and have fun with what we're doing, to be honest, and like play around with stuff. We've got impressionists who, we have David Attenborough narrating Love Island or Morgan Freeman narrating 2018 and we just kind of write a script and build out from there basically. I know everyone's going to go away from today now like looking up the hook just because it's so entertaining and that's what we want isn't it from content online? I think so. Yeah, yeah um, of course. I think, I think that's what our audience want. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we tend to go like really short, snappy, try and make you laugh or try and inspire you. So kind of take a story that I've seen people tell stories we tell in 45 minutes, we do it in five minutes, but it's equally as inspiring. So yeah, we're kind of three second rules and all that kind of stuff to try and just grab you and then, yeah, make someone tag or share, basically. That's the aim of the game. Fantastic. Yeah. And Imran, you're the founder of This Is Real, st video storytelling agency, and I know you're doing a lot of work now within the property sector. Please tell us about what you're doing. Okay, so thisisreal.co is very really niche, um, it's an organization which services a particular niche, and that's basically the premium uh, commercial and residential property sector. Yeah, please, it's, it's not for everybody, okay? It's, a, it's for a very particular group of people, and it's something that I've honed over time. I mean, I've worked, I've created content for, I mean, almost every industry in the pursuit of finding my niche, um, and we probably don't have enough time here to go through that entire history, but essentially, um, I wanted to be the best possible storyteller that I could within the field that I understand best. Because I would, I would like to be the go-to person within a particular industry, because I know that when I'm that go-to person, that people will respect my time, that they'll pay me properly, and they'll allow me to be creative in order to deliver the content that I need. So. That's what my agency does. It's uh, something that's focused. Uh, it's for the few, not the many. A bit political, that. <laughs> no, but if you're talking to everyone, you're talking to no one. Am I right? Yeah? So we all need to find our niche as storytellers. So whether you're talking about property, whether you're doing entertainment and pranks online, or whether you're just making content about, I don't know, the latest cartoon that's out on Cartoon Network or something, Whatever you want to talk about, guys, whatever you want to tell stories about, whatever you want to make content about, it's all about finding your niche because there are going to be people out there that are interested in the things that you're interested in. Yeah? You don't want to be talking to everyone. So, guys, what makes a good digital storyteller in 2020? Because the technology is moving so fast, right? How, how do we really connect with audiences today, Mike? I think the subject is probably the most important thing, so choosing a subject that's relevant for your audience. And the big thing I look for is character. So once you've got your subject, is finding character within that, ideally character to front it, or if your subject has character, that's great. Um, those are the two kind of key aspects. And then conflict, I think. If there's conflict somewhere for you to explore that conflict, even in a comedy sketch, there's always conflict. Even if you, as a viewer, you're thinking you're just watching it, to laugh, you're laughing at some kind of conflict. That's kind of what it comes back to. But characters, 
subject, then characters, then conflict, they're the kind of three things I'd look for. But sub subject is, you've got your subject, which is very niche, so for your audience, they're going to be interested. Um, it's, yeah, subject is my main one. Yeah. You know, I think about it from an emotional um, perspective. Um, and I always, actually, when I run courses um, trying to teach digital storytelling, I ask this question. Um, and my answer is your ability to empathize with your audience. So empathy, empathy is the number one quality of being a great storyteller. You know, that ability to, and you know, if you look at the definition of empathy, it's knowing what it's like to walk in somebody else's shoes. And the more you can understand that, the more you can understand who that person or that group of people is, and then you can reverse engineer it towards the platforms and the content mediums uh, that you want to use. The content medium that I use at this moment in time is video. Right? Um, I can tell visual stories using video. I can turn it around relatively quickly. I know exactly what my client is looking for. I think I know what it's like to walk in their shoes. But that doesn't mean I can just rest on my laurels because the digital landscape and the way of delivering these stories is changing. Our attention is shifting. So now we see a, a big drive towards audio as well. The ability to tell an audio story is completely different to the ability to tell a video story which is different to be able to tell a story through a still image. So the consistent part, the bit which gives us some certainty in the future is actually to hone the ability to empathize with our audience and to tell stories and to, and to recognize story and to tell those stories. The mediums will change, the platforms will change, but if we have that then it gives us a good chance to succeed in the future I think. So what I hear you saying there is it's, it's about the value that we're giving our audiences. And I guess that's what keeps them coming back because they know what they can get from your platforms and in your content. But how do you know, if you're starting out, like a lot of people in this room might be, how do you know what platforms to use, where to even begin, how to decide whether your medium is video or audio or the written word? How do you even start? Um, probably the best place is ask yourself where you're spending your time. So I'd presume if you're if you're things fashion and you want to get into fashion content creation, I'd imagine you've got people who inspire you in that area. And I'd imagine there are places you would go to seek out that content. I would start with there and kind of that's probably you found them there, that probably means that's where it is. There's obvious ones like fashion is an Instagram platform. Um, but I would also if you've got the skill set, try and repurpose your content. So we have a thing at the hook called, and forgive me for this, but it's called Fisty TV. Um, and it's Facebook, Instagram, Stories, Twitter, YouTube, uh, sorry, Miss Snapchat, off, TikTok, and then IGTV. And it's like a, every piece of content, essentially, we can repurpose for each platform. Um, so YouTube's a completely different aspect ratio. It's a lot longer, but we can repurpose it the whole way around. So if you're capturing that content, you could put it out everywhere. Um, it can be difficult if you're shooting a mobile and YouTube's your way around, but other than that, generally there's ways of going across every platform and then you've got more chance of hitting the right people. Now, I know a lot of people in this room might be thinking, but The Hook's got loads of people working for you and it's just me by myself and repurposing content. Now, let's talk about, in terms of actually repurposing things, you know, practically, yeah. how long does it take? Start with your longest first. So if probably out of those it would be YouTube, that's ideally a 10 minute video. And then, then you've got your hero piece essentially, and then you just work your way down. It depends how, in this case, if it's video content, it depends how good an editor you are. Um, or if you've got friends, there's probably some editors in here, go make them friends and ask them to help you. That contributes towards their portfolio. In turn, helps you kind of repurpose it. But honestly, I mean, I, I can't edit. I have people do it for me, but one of my editors could repurpose for his platforms in half a day once the initial hero thing's done. Um, right, so practicing so practicing how to do it yourself but also using your network around you. Yeah, if you're kind of if your thing is shooting or if you like being the person asking the questions, you probably come across a friend who likes editing, who doesn't want to be on camera, who kind of that's their thing. They like that side of storytelling make them an extra special friend and just ask them for a favour. And in the same time, they're getting to edit work, they're getting to understand the different, the different platforms and how to edit towards them. 
and you're getting your content repurposed. Like teams, everything kind of works in teams. We have four main stages of production. You can have people with different skill sets along. So just, yeah, make friends. Fabulous. And I want to talk a little bit about mobile journalism in Iran because you, you've taught hundreds of people how to tell stories using their mobile phones, using the platforms themselves purely to tell stories, using um, external apps or native apps on the cameras themselves. Can you just tell us a little bit about smartphone content creation? Because as we've alluded to earlier in previous panels, you know, some people just have a smartphone and the power of the smartphone nowadays is, is, is crazy, guys. Like, I've been to newsrooms, I teach TV producers how to use their smartphones to shoot, edit and broadcast things for television audiences, for radio audiences, just on their mobile phones. So Imran, can you just talk us through this technology? What, what are we capable of here? Well, basically, the phone in your pocket is a fully-fledged film production studio. That, that's what it is, you know, whether you realise it or not. Um, now, even though you accept that, you might think, well, maybe some of these bigger cameras here is really what you might need in order to have a career in content creation. And whilst there is definitely a place for these, guys, there is definitely a place for these. Um, in so many different areas, especially when you're dealing with social media, the phone you have in your pocket, and not just the latest phone, you could go back five years. I started my consultancy with an iPhone 5S, right? And people were paying me good money in order to produce content. They weren't bothered what I was producing it on. I did, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't part of the sales pitch. I will produce your content using my phone, right? That, that wasn't gonna go down well. It was probably gonna have a negative because of the perception. But the perception is not the reality. And even today, I still use an iPhone 10, which is two years old, in order to produce all of the content. Because not only does it film, it has a, it has a full editing suite on it as well, an app, I mean, various grades depending upon where you are on the spectrum, uh, all the way up to something called LumaFusion, which costs you about 15 to 20 pounds as a flat fee as well. And you can do pretty much 90 to 95% of what you can do on a desktop. I can't edit on a desktop. I can't do it. Give me a desktop editor and I'll struggle because I've always done it through my phone. And on top of that, you've got the third part of the Trident, which is publishing your content. So what you have in your hand, in your pocket, is the ability to film or write or take a picture, to, e to edit and then to publish as well. And I think if I, if I was offering any advice uh, to somebody who's just getting started on this, um, it is to learn by doing, to repeatedly, to repeatedly try, try things without, without any real expectation of of anything really, that you're doing it for the sake of it, for the learning and the enjoyment and to see what you like and see potentially what um, what you can put out there and what connects with your audience. Again, I'll use like an example of my, my boy um, this time. My boy's uh, he's just about to turn 16, um, big Liverpool fan, represent, um, and um, he uh, has been producing like little videos of the players based upon kind of ripping content off here, there, and everywhere. And he just does it. And he's been doing it consistently for a while and putting it out on Instagram and expecting nothing really off the back of it. Over the course of a year of doing it, he's now built up a community of uh, editors in the same space who support each other and share the learning with each other in order to get better. And they have little competitions with each other as well and, and alert each other to opportunities where they may get paid as well. So you can see how that happens. But to get to that position, it takes a huge amount of effort. And that huge amount of effort, you're only going to make it if you're doing something which you feel passionate about, right? Not necessarily something that's going to earn you a lot of money immediately, if that makes any sense. It's interesting to see, you know, to have you both on the panel because it just, it just really highlights the fact that no matter what equipment you have, no matter what backing you have, there's no excuse now in 2020 to not go out there and produce the content, right? So we can all potentially be, as Imran said, we can all be a TV channel now. We can all have our own social media presence. We don't have to wait to be approached by a TV company or the 10 o'clock news, right? We can all do that ourselves. So let's just have a talk about content and the way we angle content online. Because I know a few people in this room might think, well, I'm just 
and I'm from this modeling agency or I sell windscreen wipers like how do I how how do I know how to angle my content because you guys have gone down the entertaining the funny route but how do people know whether to do selfie videos or whether it's very traditional broadcast quality like how do you even go about thinking that because I know you guys work on a lot of different campaigns and you probably angle things slightly differently yeah. depending on what you're doing um, trial and error is I've made a lot of bad mistakes like we watched a lot of content completely die um, like online it gets no engagement so you don't do that again and when it gets lots of engagement you learn what did well and you do that again basically for clients we look at you know different leagues we have we can A-B test in the background on different things and like position content so we can have the same video with eight different creative angles going with it to see which message resonates with an audience and that before that's before it ever even sees the actual social platform and stuff that's kind of more of the dark arts of social media but um, just learning through and it changes all the time to be honest like it's what worked two years ago people are kind of bored of now I was going to say um, it's a bit scary for content creators to think that there's new updates to the algorithms to what you can yeah. do and how do you even keep abreast of that um, just keep employing people who know what they're doing that's, um, <laughs> that's my yeah um, just trying to you, we have like social listening tools and stuff that kind of like show you constantly what's going on um, but you just have to have people who are always online and you can kind of spot trends and see and we're, we've got quite a big meme culture where we are so we have like a whole whatsapp chat that's just dedicated to memes and if someone sees like a new meme it's like right put that in there and we just kind of try to be abreast of it but it's yeah, just lots of, I mean, it sounds like the dream job, you're on social media all day, basically. We pay people to do that and to, like, say what they see. So That's like our lives. We could technically work there. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about social media in terms of what you can do on each platform, because obviously there's groups on social media now, there's different pages, you can slide into people's DMs you don't even know. Like, what techniques that do you guys use to get your content seen by people? Because, I mean, at the hook, you've already got... A massive audience right so I guess you don't I mean am I right you don't have to rely on reaching out to too many people or do you do a lot of um, influence marketing we do influence marketing as like how let's say there's the hook labs which is our marketing agency so we do like we sell like sim cards and stuff like that and none of that ever goes out on the the hook social channel so we do do that side of it as well and we we reach out to content creators all the time so we post a lot of UGC so at the moment DMs on Instagram is like our most successful way of getting in touch with someone asking if we can post their video um, so we still do all that stuff as well um, but we have like the style guide set for each platform and like a best practice kind of how long the video should be or um, like Instagram for example images at the moment get double the amount of engagement over a video and stuff that we kind of we have all that information and we just work towards it basically um, TikTok's the only one if anyone's got any tips like we've got an audience but I don't know what we're doing to like get that audience <laughs> I have no idea well TikTok's um, I guess an interesting platform at the moment I know Gary Vaynerchuk talks about um, TikTok a lot and how you know we need to trial and error on these new platforms in order to see what works and how you know if we all started with YouTube 10 years ago we'd all have you know thousands and thousands of subscribers now and Imran you you used to talk about Musical.ly a lot before it changed to oh TikTok so yeah, I feel yeah. like this guy is one of the pioneers of using it, really. But tell us, have you been using TikTok or no. what are your experiences with it? No, no, I haven't been using TikTok. Actually, I've kind of... It's really interesting. I think we're, we're at opposite ends in terms of how we deal with social media. You, you're very public, obviously, yeah. with all of the content. I am actually moving towards more kind of a private kind of space for myself because... You know, I'm not particularly in my audience. You know, I'm not looking to attract as many people as possible, um, or to go viral in any sense. You know, I know exactly who it is I want to connect with, and I, you know, I want to create content which, um, which is both commercial and art. I know that sounds quite up its own backside, right? But, you know, that's that's where I like to position myself. You know, it's got to earn me a decent amount of money, but also it has to be something which I feel that is authentic and creative and and honest as well and a lot of the content that I produce you won't actually get to see because it will be shown in like you know private forums uh, you know at, at meetings such as this in Brussels or, or whatever um, so I will set up a few private groups I, I guess it creates an air of mystique and, um, and exclusivity and that tends to attract 
particular types of people who know what those groups are about and to join it and then I can I have a very focused audience you know who can then really engage uh, engage with with my content so unfortunately Caroline my days of musically TikTok you know the only thing you really find if you follow me on Instagram I, I don't suggest that you do right is um, you know whenever I go to the gym I use it as an opportunity to sharpen my video skills because obviously going to the gym is quite monotonous isn't it especially if you go to the same gym especially if you see my gym because um, I, I live in Yorkshire it's a converted cinema it's like really old school and I don't do many different things in there but that offers me an opportunity to be, try and be creative around how I tell the story of me being in the gym as well so if you do follow me on social I'm sorry but that's probably what, what you'll see <laughs> But you made a good point there in terms of the creativity because, you know, what I like to tell the people I'm training is the most important thing is what you're filming and how you're telling the story as opposed to what you're using to shoot, right? Because yeah. we work in mobile journalism. And as Imran said, we all have a TV production studio in our pocket, you know, and it's, you know, you don't want all the gear and no idea, do we? It's the same with technology, with storytelling. And you know, the, the, the shots that makes Mike videos go viral and Imran's, you know, get him jobs and clients is because of the way that you're telling the story. So I, would, I guess I would urge you all to go out there and watch as much content as, as you can and see what engages you as, as Mike alluded to. Does anyone have any questions we can put to the panel? Any burning issues you'd like to talk about? Yes. Oh, so far away. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I think tonight's been really um, inspiring and really positive. Um, but I just want to talk about the other side of some of this, which we've seen recently in the media and the press, but the sort of the negative stuff that can be attracted through some of the platforms that we're talking about. Um, negative, to say the least, but sinister and horrible at the worst. And this is to everyone in the room that's engaged in all of this and the panellists, is what what can you what have you done if you've experienced that if you haven't have you got any ideas of what you could suggest to especially young people everyone but it's i mean i don't use social media because if i got anything negative i'd want to know where they lived so so basically it's for for anyone who does use it but especially for young people and children because we work with lots of i've got my own kids but also we work with children young people any suggestions about how people can really look after their own mental health and well-being when faced with kind of either negative or sinister responses to stuff that's put out there or even getting no responses which is kind of quite painful i would imagine for some people so any suggestions um would be really welcome thank you thank you um well i'll just kick this off um, well as as rob talked about i i actually run a, a country music channel and you can imagine that country music is very, very niche in London. And the people um, that follow country music are just huge fans of it. But the people who aren't, sometimes you can get comments on your videos that are like quite rude and quite mean and just hurtful. I would just say ban straight away, delete and ban them from your page. And I've, you know, in, in the light of recent events, I've, I've watched a lot of videos about how we can kind of stop trolls on social media. And the best way is not to, to to get in an argument with them because at the end of the day you do get keyboard warriors that can say whatever they want um, so so banning and deleting them and moving on and um, a friend of mine once told me that um, if you read five good comments <laughs> when you see one negative comment uh, I don't know why we highlight the bad comments so much in our brains when you know five to one five people are loving your stuff and one of them's not how about you guys have you experienced negativity uh, well we police against that like internally if we 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 ban people and we delete mm -hmm. stuff that's kind of we think crosses the lines of community standards um on a personal level i have like a, a two me's like there's the me at work who runs this social thing and then there's the me who has 23 instagram followers and posts once every three months and i've like kind of due to mental health reasons made an effort to really distinguish between the two um but i, I think it's it's a really difficult topic to have a correct answer to to be honest because people are still going to post stuff online and people are going to be nasty so I think that the platforms maybe need to try even harder to police it I think as as publishers can try even harder and I think that it's yeah it's a really difficult one because if people continue to comment the way they do 
it's quite hard to police the whole of a social media. So I think banning and, and kind of policing yourself is all you can do. And if someone says something, it's having the inner strength to try and say, right, I'm not accepting that, or to walk away from it for 24 hours or something like that. But it's, it, it's, I don't think there's a simple solution, in all honesty. Yeah, Imran? yeah I, don't, I don't really get much, you know, much personal, or well, any personal abuse. But that doesn't mean that the content that I consume online doesn't have its impact. You know, um, you know whether it's an incident that's related to my faith, you know, which then becomes a way of tarring a community with the same brush. You know, every time something like that happens, um, you know, sometimes I feel it's best just to switch off rather than to to fight against the wave of whatever stuff's going on online. And it's not just it's not just that. It's like politics as well. We saw from the recent. Brexit side of stuff, um, you know, how polarizing that can be and how toxic it can be. And it's the same, I guess we all kind of realize that, you know, when we consume like bad news, negative news all the time, it starts to eat away at the way that we feel. And that's something that we can control. I know we all want to be informed about stuff. And unfortunately, my favorite platform is Twitter, which is the most toxic place that you can probably spend your time, you know, um, whatever, whatever subject it is. But at the same time, to know your limits and to know that you know it's okay, just switch off, take a break, you know, um, and just to be self-aware enough uh, to do that is seriously important. Because as soon as your self-worth starts to get tied up too closely with uh, what you're consuming, then then you're going to have problems. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, good evening. Um, I was thinking about audience and one of the things that I was going through now, considering I just browsed through Instagram just a few moments ago, so I was thinking, um, okay, you have a really interesting topic to go through, and this goes with any person, and the topic in question seems to be a really sensitive one, and you're like, oh, I want to talk about this, I want to advocate for this, or like, I want to do a journalistic um, investigation on this, but Regardless if your intentions are good or not, you also have to keep in, uh, I'm, uh, you also have to keep in mind that the general audience would be like, "Oh, we find this really offensive, even though what you're doing is kind of even though you do have good intentions." I was thinking like, how would I be able, how would I or in, anyone in general be able to like get the message out without like trying to like but you also but at the same time you don't want to like you don't want to like uh, minimize the amount of impact that certain views would generate um, can I go? so you've got you've got two ways of attracting an audience you could mm -hmm. try the short term or the long term mm -hmm. um, the short term you're going to have to engage in outrage culture right so actually having something to talk about which is quite controversial is useful it works for Katie Hopkins it works for Piers Morgan it works for all of these kind of guys right um, but that's sh short termist if you've got something to say, which is highly valuable, um, and you want to put across kind of a balanced perspective and you can add real value, and you've got time and the money to support yourself whilst you're doing this, then do it that way, you know, mm -hmm. with honesty and integrity. And again, you will find your audience when you do that over and over again. You know, it might not be the biggest audience, but it'll be a true audience for what it is that you have to say. The temptation is always, well, not always, for some people, is just to be controversial, you know, because mm -hmm. then that breeds the kind of uh, the fuel, if you like, to attract attention for those algorithms to really kick in and to, and to push content. Understandable. Okay, well, we'll end there. If you want to hit any of us up on social media, just make sure you follow us and just uh, send us a DM and we'll give you some advice if you need. Thank you very much, guys, for joining us today. It's been very interesting. Where's my chocolate, Rob? <laughs>